an attempted cop killing. A drug house shootout. And a violent bank robbery. A gang of dangerous criminals threatens an entire community. The FBI and an undercover ex-cop put their lives on the line to track down the gunman. In the late 1990s, one criminal terrorized an entire community. Witnesses refused to speak out. They knew the consequences could be deadly. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the violence escalated, the FBI worked with local law enforcement to launch a complex sting operation. Their mission, to lure this vicious fugitive out of hiding with the promise of a big score. And to get him off the streets for good. Camden, New Jersey, located just across the river from Philadelphia. It is one of the poorest, most crime-ridden cities in America. On February 12, 1997, Officer Stephen Leone patrols the street. It's 4.20 a.m. Officer Leone stops to catch up on some paperwork. I heard a massive amount of gunfire coming from the east side of Camden. Gunfire in excess of 50 rounds. Well, it's not unusual to hear gunfire in Camden, so it's a commonplace thing. And I try to locate a general area before I put out a call for an assistance so we didn't have cops running all over the place. Officer Leone drives toward the area of the gunshots. The streets are deserted until a suspicious car appears. Officer Leone pulls in behind the car. Then it appeared that the vehicle saw that I was a patrol vehicle and he made a left-hand turn. I went down on the seat. And then I came up and I could taste my own blood. Officer Leone has been hit in the face. Somehow he pulls himself out of his vehicle. I bailed out of the car to take up a tactical position in the rear of my vehicle in case my assailants attempted to come back or they were still in the area. I knew I was hit. I knew I was hit with a bullet in the face and the head, and I didn't know how serious I was hurt. I radioed an officer fired, down, right officer here. shot, shots shot fired. fired. Officer down, officer needs assistance immediately. My location, shots fired. Within minutes, Camden police and rescue units respond to the scene. Did you get a description of the vehicle? Despite his wounds, Officer Leone gives them a description of the shooter's car. Paramedics try to stabilize him for transport to a nearby hospital. The officer has bullet fragments embedded in his face. I took three in the scalp, one in my left eye socket, one in my right eye socket, and a little piece of my nose. I was lucky I didn't lose my vision. Paramedics rush Officer Leone to the hospital, while investigators scour the scene looking for evidence. Camden County Prosecutor Lee Solomon. The idea that somebody would be so brazen, so arrogant, um, 
to fire a weapon at a police officer is something that we mobilize against very quickly. Investigators search the area looking for the shooter's vehicle. Police are called to a house not far from the crime scene. A neighbor heard gunshots earlier that evening. You got a call for shots being fired out here. So they notice the front door is riddled with bullet holes. I hear something banging at my door. According to the man, earlier that night, someone tried to break down his front door. The resident grabbed his gun. The intruders heard him moving in the house and opened fire. The resident returned fire, forcing the attackers to retreat. Police believe the attack was what they refer to as a ninja-style robbery, where masked gunmen invade a house to steal drugs and money. Over 50 rounds are fired into the house. One of the uh, bullets passed through a wall, a refrigerator, the rear wall of the residence, and the projectile was never found. Another went through a ceiling, floor ceiling, through the roof. Again, the projectile was never found. These were high-powered weapons, and so there was cause for concern. Later that morning, a few blocks away, Police discover an abandoned vehicle. The car matches Officer Leone's description of the vehicle used in the shootout. There was broken glass. There was expended shells from the uh, AR-15 and the 45 caliber pistol found in the car. And there was blood in the vehicle. It was apparent to investigators that one of the perpetrators had been wounded. The officer runs the license plate. The car belongs to a woman who lives in the neighborhood. A canine unit picks up the scent from the car and tracks it to the same address listed on the vehicle registration. And it was found uh, two or three blocks from where I was, the location of my shooting was. A SWAT team prepares to storm the house in case the shooters are still inside. And there was an elementary school which they closed for the day because they thought there'd be a gun battle with these individuals that were heavily armed. Inside the house, there is no sign of the gunman. Instead, the SWAT team finds a woman who police discover is the owner of the vehicle. They learn that she is the girlfriend of Charlie Rodriguez, one of Camden's most violent criminals. Between 1984 and 1989, Charlie had been arrested for weapons and drug charges, as well as making terrorist threats. Crazy Charlie was known as a guy who would do anything. No violent act was beyond him. Crazy Charlie was the kind of guy that would shoot at a cop, would shoot at a, an old person, would shoot at a young person, would shoot indiscriminately. SWAT finds no sign of the gunman. Police search the premises and question the girlfriend. What's your what name? What are you doing in my house? What's your name? She tells them she was at work at the time of the shooting and that she had reported her car stolen. Investigators search the house and find drops of blood. They call for forensics to collect the blood as evidence. Some evidence tech to collect some evidence, please. Have some blood on the sink. Okay, we're doing a camera. Investigators canvass the area, questioning the girlfriend's neighbors. They find someone who remembers seeing a few men leaving the girlfriend's house very early that morning. After looking through a photo lineup, he identifies one of the men. According to police records, the suspect is Jose Baez, on parole for manslaughter and weapons violations. Police track Baez to an apartment in Deptford, New Jersey. The dangerous ex-con is investigators' only link to a would-be cop killer. A violent rampage in Camden, New Jersey. 
results in the shooting of a police officer. Evidence leads investigators to Jose Baez, an ex-con they believe was involved in the shooting. Baez is quickly taken into custody. Turn around. Investigators notice the suspect has a wound on one of his hands. He recently sustained some type of bullet wound to his hand that he tried to sew up using thread himself. Police arrest Baez for parole violations and take a sample of his blood for DNA testing. In the lab, Baez's blood is compared to evidence gathered in the Leone shooting. And they were able to match the blood from him to the blood found on the scene, in the vehicle and at the house. Investigators now have proof that Baez was in the car at the time Officer Leone was shot. But they don't have evidence to suggest that he actually pulled the trigger. At first, Baez refuses to talk to authorities. But after two weeks in custody, he asks to meet with the investigators. Jose, you already, you already read your rights, so I have to go over that with you. I'm an investigator with Camden County, and I'm trying to figure out information about the shooting. Baez finally agrees to talk, but only if police take steps to protect his family. He says that Charlie Rodriguez, Crazy Charlie, was involved in the ninja robbery as well as the Leone shooting. I believe that Baez ultimately cooperated because Charlie had threatened his family. And out of fear that something might happen, he had cooperated. The Camden County Prosecutor's Office obtains a warrant on Charlie Rodriguez for the attempted murder of a police officer. They also offer a $1,000 reward for information leading to his arrest. The state of New Jersey places Charlie Rodriguez on the top 10 list of wanted fugitives. There was a manhunt every day. Every Camden cop and every cop in Camden County was looking for Charlie Rodriguez. Although Charlie is well known throughout Camden, residents are too afraid to talk to police. Fear is a, is a powerful weapon for somebody like uh, Charlie Rodriguez. In the month following Officer Leone's shooting, police question their informants. All they learn is that Charlie is hiding somewhere across the river in Philadelphia. Since Charlie is believed to have fled to another state, local police turn to the FBI for help. FBI agent John Tam obtains a federal warrant and leads a multi-state hunt for Charlie Rodriguez. I uh, start by getting good photographs, reviewing his prior criminal records, and I also uh, review uh, prison records to see who their cellmates were, who visited them while they were in prison, and uh, an attempt to identify uh, people they might be in contact with. FBI agents cast a wide net. FBI. But like local police, the FBI find that people are too terrified to talk. Charlie Rodriguez's reputation was of a, a stone-cold killer. People were very cautious about talking about him. Agents set up surveillance on Charlie's girlfriend, hoping she will lead them to Charlie. Rodriguez had enough self-discipline to stay away from her and keep her away from him, so that wasn't helping us either. Over the next few months, agents continue to question their informants and learn that Charlie is hiding in a tough Philadelphia slum known as the Badlands. A very tough neighborhood, a lot of drug uh, activity, uh, difficult to police. People live there intimidated by the criminals. It's a hard place to find a fugitive because you get very little cooperation. FBI SWAT teams raid buildings in the Badlands where Charlie is believed to be hiding. We'd get the Fugitive Task Force out over in Philadelphia, five in the morning, we'd hit the place, we'd catch somebody. They would be a criminal, but it wouldn't be Charlie Rodriguez. You know, we'd end up arresting somebody who was wanted for something else. Let's go. At the same time, on the crime-ridden streets of Camden, the FBI is running an unrelated drug investigation. And Special Agent Jim Walsh gets an unexpected tip. We obtained information that Charlie Rodriguez and his brother Joseph 
and some other individuals were planning to commit a bank robbery or a robbery of an armored car in the near future. Joseph Rodriguez, he had previously been convicted of murder in an infamous uh, drug shooting that occurred in the early 90s, uh, where two teenagers were killed on a drug corner in South Camden. According to an informant, Charlie and Joey Rodriguez are targeting one bank in particular in the nearby town of Woodland, New Jersey. Agents set up surveillance teams. If the Rodriguez brothers hit the bank, local police are nearby ready to make the arrest. But weeks pass with no sign of the robbers. Due to manpower needs, we couldn't sustain the surveillances. And after about a month and a half, we had to discontinue them. On July 19, 1997, a few weeks after the FBI ends surveillance, several heavily armed men hit the Woodland Bank. One teller is too frightened to move. Two of the robbers forced the teller to empty the cash drawers. The remaining robber guards the lobby and calls out how much time has passed. One robber tries to force the supervisor to open the vault. She tells him she can't. The vault is on a timer. He tells her if she doesn't open the vault, he will kill her. In New Jersey, the shooting of a Camden police officer launches an FBI manhunt for a violent ex-con named Charlie Rodriguez. Five months later, three men carrying semi-automatic weapons burst into a bank in Woodland, New Jersey. The bank supervisor can't open the vault. It's on a timer. One of the robbers threatens to kill her. The robbers are out of time. They have to leave before police arrive. The bank supervisor escapes with her life. FBI agents John Tam and Jim Walsh investigate the robbery. The customers and the bank employees are terrified. Special Agent Jim Walsh. All the individuals were upset. Uh, one woman had to be taken to the hospital. She was so scared she uh, suffered a minor heart attack. Can you describe any one of them at all? Because of uh, the violent uh, nature of the bank robbery, I knew immediately that it was Charlie Rodriguez and his brother. Agents and police watch the bridges to Pennsylvania and the New Jersey Turnpike for the Rodriguez brothers. They find no sign of them. At the FBI office in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, agents Walsh and Tam study surveillance photos and footage from the bank's security cameras, looking for clues. Special Agent John Tam we got a good look at the weapons they were carrying, which were semi-automatic rifles, or what is known as an AR-15. It's a very uh, dangerous weapon because standard law enforcement body armor will not stop that round. Although agents feel confident the robbers are Charlie and Joey Rodriguez, they cannot positively ID them from the surveillance. You could not identify them in any way. They were fully clothed, they had gloves on, masks, hats. Joey Rodriguez continues to live openly in Camden. The FBI doesn't have enough evidence to arrest him. Uh, Agents watch Joey, hoping he will lead them to Charlie. He realized that uh, he was the connection, if there was any, to his brother, and they stayed away from each other. Over the next seven months, 
the Camden, New Jersey area is plagued by a string of bank robberies. The Rodriguez brothers are possible suspects, but police have no hard evidence to link them to the crimes. Moorestown, New Jersey, a bedroom community north of Camden, May 23rd, 1998. More than a year after Officer Leone is shot, three men arrive at a Moorestown bank just before 8.30 a.m. They all carry assault rifles or machine pistols. The bank's doors are still locked. The robbers have lost precious time. They realize a bank employee has probably triggered the silent alarm. Two of the robbers force tellers to empty the cash drawers. The third gunman guards the lobby and calls out how much time has gone by. The robbers are tense. They decide the tellers are moving too slowly. The robbers frighten a late arriving teller. Getaway car won't start. The robbers panic. They threaten the teller, demanding her car keys. They escape in her car. Based on the robbers' M.O., agents Tam and Walsh decide that it was probably the Rodriguez brothers. Same builds. Same Surveillance same photos from the robbery same provide same even more clues. The weapons, masks, and even some of the clothing look identical to those used in the Woodland Bank robbery. The pictures prove that they were, in fact, similar type clothing worn. But the two agents lack enough evidence to charge either Rodriguez brother with bank robbery. The gang's M.O. seems to be evolving. With each robbery, they are becoming more dangerous. The violence of this group was escalating. Eventually, somebody was going to be killed, either a bank employee, a customer, or a police officer responding to a, a report of a bank robbery. There's no question somebody was going to be killed. Agents Tam and Walsh meet with the local law enforcement agencies in the cities and towns in the Camden, New Jersey area, advising them of the gang's M.O. In late July 1998, Agent Tam gets an intriguing lead from Lieutenant Roy Whitmore at the Merchantville, New Jersey Police Department. I know an individual who may be able to help us. I know a gentleman. He said, I have an individual who uh, grew up with Rodriguez and who uh, knows his brother fairly well, who might be willing to locate Crazy Charlie Rodriguez. A year and a half into the investigation, the FBI has the potential to develop an informant with access to information about Charlie Rodriguez. It was the biggest break possible because we had been looking essentially in the blind for somebody to cooperate with us and give Charlie Rodriguez up. But Lieutenant Whitmore arranged for me to meet uh, this uh, person and formulate a way to draw Charlie Rodriguez out from wherever he was hiding in Philadelphia. The informant is a former police officer who was forced to resign due to a minor weapons infraction. Well, I found him to uh, be intelligent, you know, uh, surprisingly articulate considering that he was from a very tough urban environment. And I felt him to be honest and, uh, and reliable. The ex-cop says he wants to stop Charlie before anyone else, especially a police officer, 
is shot or killed. We talked about his relationship with Joseph Rodriguez. The agents theorize that Joseph is somehow in contact with his brother so they can plan robberies. I suggested maybe he could find out something from Joseph as to if he ever saw his brother, was in contact with him, how he contacted him, and uh, the frequency of the contact, because maybe we could to, uh, take advantage of that to uh, locate Charlie Rodriguez. Agents Tam and Walsh develop a plan to use their informant to lure Charlie out of hiding. They know that the ex-cop used to sell guns. He had worked for a firearms dealer, and that was known on the street in South Camden. But now the ex-cop is legally barred from owning or selling firearms. The agents decide to use the informant's background to help establish his cover. He would go to Joseph Rodriguez and ask him if he was interested in buying a handgun. We felt this would be a good introduction uh, that he wanted to now enter the criminal element. I knew that that would interest Charlie Rodriguez because of his violent criminal nature. Criminals are always interested in acquiring new weapons. They can get rid of whatever weapon they've used before and move on to another one not connected with their, their prior crimes. The ex-cop agrees to approach Joey at a family gathering a few days later. At first, Joey is wary. Joseph knew that he had been a police officer and uh, that he had been let go from the department, and he used this as an introduction. I was wrongly fired. They screwed me over, and uh, heck with law enforcement. Let's go join the party. A few days later, Joey contacts the ex-cop and arranges a meeting. He said, yeah, I talked to Charlie about it. And Charlie's interested in, in buying the handgun. How long at all? I'll call you. So we knew we were making progress, and we knew that uh, Charlie Rodriguez was nearby. Agent Tam tells the undercover ex-cop that they need him to meet Charlie face to face. Joseph Rodriguez would be very happy to buy the gun and then give it to Charlie Rodriguez, but that wouldn't help us. So. I emphasized to him at that point that he was going to have to hand deliver the weapon to Charlie Rodriguez, where we could arrest him. The FBI has no intention of actually delivering a working gun to either Rodriguez brother. The ex-cop goes to Joey's apartment to try to set up the sale. The source was taking tremendous risks. He would have been killed immediately, in my opinion, if uh, Charlie or Joey Rodriguez found out that he was cooperating with us. Camden, New Jersey, 1998. An ex-cop embarks on a dangerous undercover operation for the FBI. Charlie Rodriguez, also known as Crazy Charlie, is suspected of shooting a police officer and robbing banks. The ex-cop attempts to infiltrate Charlie's crew by offering to sell him guns. The undercover informant meets with Charlie's brother. Joey Rodriguez, an ex-con who has served time for manslaughter, checks to see if he is wired. He did not wear a recording device or anything because we were afraid if that was found, he would be immediately killed. Slowly but surely, through a series of meetings, the ex-cop wins Joey's trust. The undercover informant tells FBI agents John Tam and Jim Walsh that Joey even asked him for advice on an upcoming robbery. I said, that's a good idea. Tell them that you're interested in participating. And uh, I thought maybe that would give us more information about where they were, you know, where they might be meeting, and we could interrupt them before they really got the whole thing going. The ex-cop adds that Charlie Rodriguez is looking for a big score this time, $100,000 or more. 
I said, well, then we're going to suggest a crime for them to commit. They want to rob somebody, we're going to give them a target to rob. Agents Walsh and Tam plan a sting operation to lure Charlie Rodriguez into the open without endangering the public. The key thing is believability. The criminal has to believe the scenario. There's going to have to be money. There has to be opportunity. There has to be a plausibility that the crime can be committed. I suggested we would have them rob an armored car servicing an automatic teller machine on the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, because this would give us a, a, an environment where we could seal off a rest stop where the ATM was located and catch them there. Agents Tam and Walsh pick a location they feel will work well. And we selected a uh, rest stop located in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The rest stop was located below the grade of the surrounding community. So if there was any gunfire or anything like that, the, the rounds would tend to be fought, shot into a hill as opposed to flying all over the place. The big thing for us was we felt that it was in a place that we could secure and control. The undercover man pitches the robbery proposal to Joey, who carefully evaluates his every word. He was able to go back to Joseph Rodriguez and say, I know this armored car driver who's willing to cooperate with us. And the armored car driver had significant sports betting debt, gambling debt, and that he wanted to be cut in on the proceeds of the robbery. The undercover ex-cop says the armored car driver will be their inside man and hand over more than $200,000. Two days later, Joey gets back to the ex-cop with an answer. Joseph Rodriguez said, Charlie, I uh, think it's a great idea. Let's go ahead with a plan and do this. Joey says he wants to check out the rest area with a third person. Who's that? A friend of mine. The ex-cop is concerned by the sudden change in plans. Joey says, don't worry about him. He's OK. You can trust him. The newcomer's name is Jose Soto. Soto had an extensive and violent criminal record. He'd also been convicted of second degree murder and was out on parole. And they drove to the rest stop and basically checked it out to see if they would be able to pull off this robbery. The rest area has a back service road. It will allow them to enter and leave the rest stop without ever going onto the turnpike. They knew they could get away and probably not be seen by anybody. The robbers liked everything about the location. And the FBI liked everything about the location because it was going to allow us to isolate them in an area where they could not escape and where the public generally would be protected from any sort of uh, firearms activity, any sort of gunshots or anything that might occur. Joey drives around the rest stop, tracing the route the armored car will take as it approaches the ATM. Joseph Rodriguez and was familiar with the location and comfortable with it. So rather than having the cooperator have to sell it to Charlie Rodriguez, Joseph Rodriguez sold it to him for us. The undercover informant tells the FBI that Charlie Rodriguez, the target of the sting, has approved the robbery for August 27th. plan now in motion. The FBI approaches the agency responsible for the turnpike and the rest area, the New Jersey State Police. Agent Tam briefs Lieutenant Colonel Robert Dunlop. Dunlop's troopers will shut down the entire area and the turnpike to protect the public. We always have the news helicopters up in the air. Radio stations would have broadcasted that there was a backup on the turnpike. To make this thing work, we had to coordinate this 
where we would shut this rest area down just moments before our suspects arrived, um, so it wouldn't spook anyone. SWAT teams will be positioned at the turnpike entrances and inside buildings in the rest area. Three days before the sting, Tam and Walsh meet with FBI and police SWAT leaders to go over the plan to capture the Rodriguez brothers and Soto. We knew they were going to be heavily armed, and we knew that, at least in the case of Charles Rodriguez, they had a propensity to shoot people when confronted. The plan is to evacuate the rest area minutes before the Rodriguez gang arrives. The FBI's informant will park behind the rest area, but then walk to the front of the building to get out of the line of fire. The SWAT team will be hidden inside a delivery truck. For backup, snipers will be positioned on a rooftop. A tow truck would come down the access road driven by an FBI agent, and he was planning on pinning the car with the Rodriguez brothers in it at that location where they could not pull the car out. Once the gang is trapped, the SWAT team will make the arrest. The plan was a good one in the sense that if they had a, a lick of sense, they would surrender. August 27th, 1998. Agents and state police assemble at the rest area. Check, roger that. The trap is set. Crazy Charlie is considered a very dangerous and unpredictable criminal. I think everyone that was involved in this operation uh, knew that there was a great possibility that he wouldn't go down easy. As much as we planned, there was always the possibility that he would want to shoot it out. Camden, New Jersey. Charlie Rodriguez is suspected of wounding a police officer and robbing banks. August 27, 1998. FBI agents John Tam and Jim Walsh have devised a complex sting operation to trap the dangerous fugitive and his crew. Nearly 100 agents and law enforcement officers are in position at a New Jersey rest stop. But Charlie and his crew failed to show. We're wondering where we had gone wrong. Had they had found out something about it? Had they, do they now suspect the source? The agents are concerned about their informant, an ex-cop who helped them infiltrate the Rodriguez crew. If Charlie Rodriguez knows he's been set up, he could kill the FBI informant. Early that morning, I get a call from the cooperator. He tells me that uh, the Rodriguez brothers, who were to meet him at his apartment in Merchantville, New Jersey, had not arrived. We instructed the source to reach out for Joey Rodriguez and find out why they hadn't showed up. Despite the danger, the FBI's undercover man agrees to talk to Joey. Joey says that the day before, sheriffs came looking for one of the crew, Jose Soto. The undercover man informs the FBI about the problem. The county sheriff's department had a warrant for Jose Soto for failure to pay child support. So that had kind of spooked them, and they decided not to go forward with it. Agent Walsh asks deputies to tell Soto that all they want from him is a promise to pay his child support. That's right. The Rodriguez brothers and Soto are relieved. The next day, Joey meets with the ex-cop near the Ben Franklin Bridge to tell him Charlie has chosen a new date for the robbery, September 1st. The FBI sting operation is back on. According to their insider, Charlie and the crew are now supposed to arrive at his apartment early in the morning of the robbery. All of them will drive to the rest stop together. There was some consideration to arresting him at the apartment. 
However, SWAT team leaders felt that it was not as safe an environment as the rest stop because there were other people living in the apartments above and on either side. The apartment complex was next to a playground and an elementary school. The whole environment would be awful for a violent arrest. So we wanted to get them out of there. It was agreed upon that uh, we would go with the original plan and it would take place at the rest stop. The morning of the robbery, the FBI's undercover man waits at his apartment for the crew to arrive. Up to this point, Charlie Rodriguez had not showed up. The source had not yet seen or met Charlie Rodriguez during all this. He finally gets to meet with Charlie face to face. The source has an opportunity to go outside to get orange juice and donuts to bring back to them. He takes the opportunity to call Agent Tam. The robbery is going forward as planned. Yeah, they're in the apartment. It's definitely a go. At the apartment, the crew puts on bulletproof vests and checks their weapons. The FBI's inside man puts on a distinctive baseball cap. We had him wearing a baseball cap that everybody would recognize so that they would know that he was the cooperator. The robbers leave for the rest area in two stolen cars. FBI surveillance keeps agents informed of the robber's location so they can evacuate the rest area before they arrive. We shut down both the rest area and the turnpike within a 10 to 15 minute time period. The undercover man parks one of the stolen cars in a nearby neighborhood to use as a getaway car after the robbery. He then drives the Rodriguez brothers and Soto down the back road toward the rest area. Already there, FBI agents prepare for the sting. I knew this was going to be a very dangerous operation. The source was going to be put in danger, plus a lot of agents and law enforcement personnel. My concern was to we not have anybody seriously injured or killed during this operation. We're just trying to arrest these people with the least amount of injury to anyone. The FBI SWAT team waits inside a delivery truck. We had FBI snipers on the rooftop of the, uh, the rest stop in the event they got out of the car and tried to run away or fire at, at agents or anyone. Nearly 100 law enforcement officers are hidden in and around the rest area. It doesn't matter how many of these operations you've been on, there's always a, a, an adrenaline rush just prior to. What's going through my mind is that I hope we don't have uh, gunfire. I hope no one's injured. I hope that we can take these people down without any, any serious uh, problems. The FBI's informant drives the crew along a back road into the rest area. The source parked exactly where he was told to park. And our plan was to disable their vehicle by ramming it with a tow truck, which would probably knock the firearms out of their, out of their hands. And then they would be uh, confronted by the SWAT team. The FBI agent in the tow truck waits for the go-ahead signal, the undercover man leaving his car. The main concern of this whole plan was getting the source out of the car, the safety of the source. And uh, once he got out of the car, I felt everything would be fine. But before the FBI source can get out of the car, Charlie senses that something is wrong. 
the informant's cover is in jeopardy of being blown. The wrong move now could cost him his life. You want to ride in the trunk or you want to drive the car? At a rest area in New Jersey, the FBI launches a sting operation to catch a gang of dangerous bank robbers. Gang leader Charlie Rodriguez senses a trap. He forces the driver of the car, an FBI cooperator, back into the car, preventing an FBI SWAT team from moving in. The undercover man is trapped. Agent Tam makes a difficult decision. So I tell the SWAT team to go ahead and execute their secondary plan, which was the takedown. And that also involved the tow truck ramming the car. The tow truck drives around to pin the robber's car. As the tow truck approached, Charlie told the source, something's wrong here, this is a setup. Let's get out of here. Needing to protect his identity, the FBI's undercover man speeds away from the SWAT team. One of the gunmen tries to shoot at the agents. The SWAT members open fire. When the gunfire erupted, I think all of us in the back of our minds were saying, I hope we don't end up hitting our confidential source. The tow truck slams into the rear end of the getaway car. When it was finally over and we had these people safely in custody, I think everyone felt a tremendous amount of relief and satisfaction that it went down well. Incredibly, the undercover man has not been wounded. Yeah. FBI agents recover a huge arsenal of weapons from the Rodriguez brothers and Soto. The amount of weapons and the amount of ammunition that was recovered from inside this car was something that uh, I have never seen or heard of before. It's more firepower than would be necessary to rob a thousand banks. The weapons included an AR-15 converted to automatic, a machine pistol with a silencer, and an AK-47 Chinese clone also converted to automatic. Each of the gunmen also carried sidearms with the serial numbers drilled out and dozens of fully loaded magazines. Altogether, they had well over a thousand rounds of ammunition. Charlie Rodriguez made a remark that if he had known what was going to happen, he would have brought his hand grenades. For them to actually have been arrested without anyone getting hurt with the kind of ammunition and the, the kind of weapons that they had in their person was an incredible feat. The Rodriguez brothers were violent criminals. I mean, they'd killed before, they would kill again. And, and there were, the only solution to that is to lock them up forever, which was the ultimate, um, ultimately what happened here. On March 30th, 2000, Jose Soto was sentenced in federal court to 37 years for the attempted armored car robbery and weapons violations. Charlie and Joey Rodriguez are sentenced to life without parole for two bank robberies, the attempted robbery of an armored car, and weapons violations.